Great. My name is Louis Prawl. I'm a postdoctoral fellow in the uh, Center for Soft and Living Matter in the Department of Bioengineering at UPenn. Um, and first, I'd like to thank uh, Development for the opportunity to present uh, some of this postdoctoral work. Um, so I've been really excited about um, the, the factors that, uh, the physical and geometric factors that sculpt the embryonic kidney epithelium. And so the the, um, epith the the kidney is one of these organs that forms through a branching morphogenesis process. So these branched epithelial tubule networks form by uh, iterative rounds of bifurcations and invasion into uh, the surrounding tissue. And this is uh, a pr uh, this is a um, process that is found in multiple different vertebrate systems. So shown here, or organs rather, um, shown here are several examples from um, mammalian biology, but really the goal of this process is to build an epithelial tree-like structure. And the tips of these uh, of these branches are um, structures that are uh, required for organ function. So in the mammary gland, this would be asini, the function in secretion. In the lung, these are alveoli, the function in gas exchange, and what I'll be talking about today, the kidney are nephrons, which function in filtration. And so you might imagine that uh, a secondary goal here is to build enough of these structures to accommodate the physiological demands of adult function. And certainly in the kidney, um, the number of nephrons is very important to health. Uh, there's a striking amount of variability in the number of nephrons in an otherwise healthy adult population. So between about 100,000 and a million nephrons per kidney. And unfortunately, too few nephrons predisposes individuals for adult kidney disease or hypertension. And um, kind of compounding this issue, about a third of all birth defects occur in the kidney, and these can be uh, severe, like renal agenesis, where the kidney fails to form altogether, or they can be much more subtle, like a duplicated urinary collecting system, and really uh, have, cause problems to arise only under certain circumstances. But <clears throat> ultimately, uh, when kidney failure does occur, there are very few available treatment options, namely dialysis or transplantation. So. As an engineer, I think one of the exciting prospects would be to be able to build properly organized kidney tissue and use this as a, as a suitable source of tissue replacement or uh, properly organized or organoids for disease modeling. So we want, we want to understand something about how uh, this branching morphogenesis process occurs and builds enough of these structures. And one of the kind of traditional ways that this has been done uh, is through organ explant culture. And this is a movie from Nils Lindstrom's lab at the University of Southern California. Um, and uh, you can see this mouse embryonic kidney explant bearing a fluorescent label in the epithelium is undergoing branching morphogenesis. And uh, as this organ is growing, you see these tips uh, that are forming, they're sort of uh, duplicating or bifurcating at the, uh, at the surface. And if we zoom in, you can see that this is happening in close uh, kind of communication with the surrounding mesenchyme, which is secreting growth factors that fuel branching. And it also contains a resident stem cell population that will intermittently um, condense below the branching tips and uh, epithelialize and form early nephron structures. So you can see one of these forming in the tip to the right. And uh, a few things to note here, all this branching and nephron formation occur are occurring at the surface and there are repulsion or uh, certain interactions that are keeping these domains separate. So they're distributed across the surface. And so yeah, then the question is really, how does the kidney pack enough tips and nephrons onto the surface for adult function? So one of the first things that we did uh, in this project was to look at um, the kind of surface tip arrangements at different developmental stages. And so here a, a tip is shown in green or the uh, with a you could hear in stain um, and surrounded by a population of pink um, cap mesenchyme cells. This is the transcription factor for um, for the cap mesenchyme or the stem cell population, and you can see differences that are um, kind of more than just the uh, organ overall organ growth. Um, at, at E14, in earlier stages of branching, you see that there's some kind of distance between the tips. They're sort of randomly oriented. But then at around E17, E18, you can start to see like this, this crowding um, and almost long range ordering um, of, of adjacent tips. So multiple families of these will be pointed kind of almost in the same direction. And this is actually really uh, similar to like a uh, abiotic systems like colloids or crystals. So 
we wanted to ask, are these kidney tip patterns developmentally programmed or are they a consequence of these geometric constraints and kind of the packing inherent in the system? So we can further explore uh, some of this packing physics and start to apply some of the analysis tools that have been developed for these colloidal or uh, crystalline systems. And one of the ones that we looked at first was this area fraction where we can subdivide the, uh, the cap, um, draw uh, uh, domains around these clusters of cap mesenchyme cells. And then the remainder of this area would be occupied by the cortical stroma. And so if we, we calculate this fraction at different developmental stages, we find that it actually passes into this like 80 or 90% regime where we start to observe things like square packing or uh, hexagonal packing. So this is a, a model output of uh, tubule geometries at, at kind of different packing constraints, but you can see an example of what, it, what I'm referring to here where earlier, um, uh, earlier developmental stages would have this sort of amorphous geometry they adopt a square-like packing with long-range ordering at intermediate stages. And then uh, around E16, E17, they become more hexagonally packed. And then if we look at uh, e, e, an E17 kidney, we can observe the coexistence of these different packing phases next to each other uh, in, in patches on the surface. Um, and so another thing that we can that we want to do here is we want to see kind of how far can we go with this this packing analogy? Can we understand this as an analog for some of these vertex models that have been used to explore um, uh, how cell shape uh, impacts the mechanics of, of epithelia, for example? And so we know that these um, tip domains are contractile. Uh, we, if you micro dissect um, kidney tissue, then it will. Um, it will contract. Um, and uh, we know that the stromal interfaces that separate these domains are under tension. These stromal cells are aligned uh, kind of perpendicular to the domain. So when we define a shape index, and this is a, the, a dimensionless number that's the ratio of the perimeter to the square root of the area. So th this kind of gives you a, a, a a proxy for how elongated shapes are. So it's a, a higher shape index is more like this rectangle, which is an elongated shape um, in this 2D plane. And then as they become more circular, it, it decreases to a number that's more like 3.6 or 3.7. And one interesting thing that's been uh, defined for the kind of physics here is that if the average shape index is above a certain threshold, <clears throat> the system behaves like a fluid. The elements can move around each other. So this would be more elongated objects. They're able to move around each other within uh, uh, within the, the plane. But then um, at a uh, past this threshold, so below this threshold, the system becomes jammed and it functions more like a solid. So, the, uh, so a force on one of these elements will transmit throughout the tissue. So we wanted to explore does the kidney undergo a rigidity transition? And can we, uh, can we uh, understand some of the aspect, the characteristics of this? So one of the first things we did was we turned to microindentation in collaboration with Paul Jean May's lab at um, UPenn. So they have, a, um, they have an instrument that consists of a tensiometer and a Z-Sage stepper motor attached to a cylindrical indenter. So we can use this indenter to basically poke the kidney's surface and uh, um, at a scale that's several um, uh, tip domains, 254 micron diameter. And then we can measure the uh, stiffness uh, for a small indentation as the slope of the force versus indentation depth curve. But then if we hold at a particular um, indentation depth, we can measure the viscoelastic or the time dependent relaxation. So we measured this for multiple kidneys kind of leading up to this jamming, this purported jamming transition. And we find that uh, indeed the stiffness increases over about twofold and the viscous relaxation constant uh, decreases. So we're finding that the kidney is stiffening across this developmental time window and the surface is becoming less uh, viscoelastic, less able to, to remodel. 
And then the other prediction that we could make here is that, as I mentioned, these, these should be transmitting forces to their neighbors. So the addition of a new branching tip would uh, change the stress state of the neighbors. And this is not something that we are currently able to uh, image directly in, uh, in the kidney. Uh, unfortunately, live imaging techniques are not able to support uh, kind of the full three-dimensional structure of an embryonic A17 kidney, but we are able to uh, make, uh, we, this is kind of what we envision for this, this process, where as more of these tips are branching and adding material, they're kind of changing the packing state of their neighbors and changing the, the local stresses, and these little bursts of stress that appear. And so we wanted to try to at least indirectly measure this. Um, so as I mentioned, we have the we we're assuming these uh, tips are uh, uh, elastic and contractile domain separated by um, tense layers of stroma that encircle them. So we can cut between two tips and measure the recoil of the of the stroma and get a uh, uh, get some sort of uh, report of the stress state uh, in that way. So we labeled kidneys with a dye that labels the epithelial tips and then a dye that labels the entire surface. And we can um, then make cuts between pairs of tips. And this is our, our uh, video of our laser cutting. Um, and so we switch to the, uh, the channel that's labeled, where the entire surface is labeled, and we can measure the retraction over time. So over about 45 seconds. We then fit these to a Kelvin Voigt model, which contains an elastic and a viscous component and measure the uh, retraction um, or the, uh, the widening of this gap over uh, defined time intervals. And so what we found is that uh, for this E17 kidney, the data points shown here, or for these E17 kidneys, the data points shown here in black, um, the more elongated tips, which are the newer, freshly branched tips, actually have a higher rebound distance. They're experiencing a higher recoil versus these later tips uh, that have become more circular and have separate, and the domains have now separated from their neighbors, these have a, a smaller rebound distance. And these are correlated with the average shape index of, of the pair of tips that we are cutting. And interestingly, we found basically no correlation at embryonic day 15, which is where, which is before the onset of this, uh, of this jamming transition. So this suggests that this indeed has transitioned to a, a state where uh, forces are transmitted uh, to adjacent um, or at least of these interfaces between adjacent um, tubules. And so then we wanted to ask a developmental question, how do these forces transmitted between niches impact nephron formation? And as I had shown before, nephrons form uh, at the, uh, the kind of below the, the surface, below the branching tips um, in these what we call armpit regions. And we know that the nephron formation rate is basically keeping pace with the new, uh, the, the number of niches um, at uh, at these at the developmental stage that we're looking at. So this is measurements that are done by Short et al. And so we have this kind of picture emerging of like every time a branch occurs, this creates a new nephron site. We wanted to see like are do we have some sort of signature of this uh, within our shape index measurements? And so we can score for the presence of either an early nephron structure, which would be an aggregate of 6-2 expressing cells below the, below the tips, or uh, the presence of a contiguous lumen, which means that the nephrons have fused uh, with the epithelium. And um, we do wind up, uh, we did wind up finding a, a sort of a two-step process here almost. Uh, a rolling average number of nephrons per tip uh, starts to increase uh, for shape index below about 3.91. So what this is suggesting is a freshly branched tip is not producing nephrons until it reaches a certain stage in the branching life cycle. And then the uh, and then this is going to be uh, creating kind of these instructive cues for nephron formation. And so the, the picture that we now have emerging is this cyclic process where uh, the stress state of the uh, of these branching tips changes over the branching life cycle. And every time a branch occurs, this creates a window for nephrogenesis. So the uh, kind of the conclusions that I've what I've shown you today, um, we found evidence for tubule packing in these uh, <clears throat> at the uh, of the domains of the kidney surface and these bear some resemblance to jam crystalline solids. This allowed us to make some predictions like the kidney surface is uh, stiffening over developmental time. Um, and, uh, and 
there are local mechanical stresses because at a certain point this starts to for, to uh, behave as a solid and that these are um, these are instructive to nephron formation. So then ongoing work in the lab, uh, uh, we're interested um, uh, in measuring gene expression across niche life cycle by spatial transcriptomics. This is actually work that's uh, being carried out by two Hughes Lab grad students currently. And then what I'm really excited about is taking this as uh, kind of a future inspiration for trying to uh, engineer functional kidney tissue in vitro and possible engineer the branching process. Um, so I'm uh, really thankful to my advisor, Alex Hughes, and the uh, students in the, uh, in the Hughes Lab, um, I, especially the co-authors on uh, uh, the, this packing work, Jia Gang Lu and John Viola. Um, Ella Hayward Laura and uh, Trevor Chan were rotation students who contributed really significantly to that as well. Um, and then, yeah, our collaborators and uh, funding sources. And I'd like to thank you for your attention and take any questions. Great, thanks, Lewis. Um, are there any questions? Please enter into the Q and A box. Um, I had one short question. Uh, how do you? plan to manipulate this system to get better branching and expanding organoids? Because yes, uh, as, as you both know, like nephrogenesis happens all at once in organoids not, and it doesn't continue. Yeah, we're, I think there are a couple of different angles here. I'm, I'm really interested in like, could we be producing new niches, uh, new branching niches through um, optogenetics? So I'm trying mm -hmm. to, trying to see if we could cause like have a patterned light stimulus to uh, create new branching sites. Um, as for the nephron progenitor uh, question, yeah, they do all exhaust in current, um, in kind of one wave in current uh, mm -hmm. organoid protocols. Uh, I know we're interested, or at least the Hughes lab is broadly interested in uh, trying to introduce kind of cyclic cues. Uh, could we mimic something from the branching process? Um, but there may be other uh, cues that we could manipulate that are related to things that are inherently changing in the epithelium or something like that. Mm 